started with a little personal story. When I joined Human Rights, it was 1980 in Geneva. And it was in July 1980. And it was very hot. And one afternoon of July 80, uh, I was sitting in my office. I was just recruited in Human Rights. And I hear drums in the yard of the UN. I lean over the window and I see a procession of indigenous peoples in, um, in uh, uh, their costumes drumming and in front of the procession were old people, very old people supported by others because they couldn't walk very easily. And it was an incredible sight. You, you saw some footage of this during the film. It was a little bit of footage there, which looks historic, kind of black and white. And like everybody else, we went down to the yard to find out who are these people. Uh, it was very impressive, you know. And uh, I found out, to my surprise, that they were looking for the Human Rights Office. And actually, that their co the contact that they had was a colleague of mine in human rights, a senior colleague, uh, Mr. Augusto Williamson Diaz, who actually was the very first person in the United Nations to deal with indigenous people's rights. And he became my mentor after that. So in that year, in 1980, it would have been, how can I say, unimaginable that on the 29th of April, 2012, we would be sitting here and having this briefing, and that we would have a UN declaration on the rights of indigenous people. It was it was very difficult to believe this. That's how things started. But uh, before we uh, we talk about the most more contemporary times, a history that we like to trace is back to the 1920s because there were indigenous leaders who went to the precursor of the UN, which was the League of Nations, okay? They went there, it was Chief Descahe, and we put it in the speech of the Secretary General, you heard him say, Chief Descahe. So, uh, Chief Descahe, who was from North America, he was from Canada, he went to the League of Nations to be heard and to demand the rights of his people. And he stayed for a whole year, 1923 to 1924, in Geneva, Switzerland. It, he was not received. And he came back to uh, Canada and the US. And before he, he actually died a few months later, and he left the following words to us. He said, he gave a, a telephone, a, a radio interview. So he said, this is the story of the Mohawks, the story of the Oneidas, of the Cayugas of the Onondagas, the Senecas, and the Tuscaroras. They are the Iroquois. Tell it to those who have not been listening. Maybe I will be stopped from telling it, but if I am prevented from telling it over, as I hope I do, the story will not be lost. I have already told it to thousands of listeners in Europe. It has gone into the records where your children can find it, when I may be dead or be in jail for daring to tell the truth. I have told this story in Switzerland. They have free speech in little Switzerland. One can tell the truth over there in public, even if it is uncomfortable for some great people. I am the speaker of the Six Nations, the oldest League of Nations now existing. It's a league which is still alive and intends, as best it can, to defend the rights of the Iroquois to live under their own laws in their own little countries now left to them, to worship the great spirit in their own way, and to enjoy the rights which are as surely theirs as the white man's rights are his own." Unquote. The same year, actually a year later, a similar journey was made by another chief, a Maori chief, religious chief, to, to the League of Nations in Geneva. His name was Ratana. These people were not connected to each other. You know, one was from New Zealand, Maori, the other was from Canada and the US. But again, the Maori went to Geneva to, to complain about the fact that the Treaty of Waitangi that the Crown had signed with the Maori was being violated by the government down in New Zealand. 
And uh, again, this trip, the Maori trip was not received and went back to his country. And I'm saying this story because this is very important for us to realize that indigenous people saw themselves as sovereign and having a nation-to-nation -nation relations with governments, with states. And uh, this was uh, also confirmed by many states by signing treaties with many indigenous peoples in many cases. Maybe not in the past necessarily, but in many other parts of the world. So, who are the indigenous peoples and why are we talking about indigenous peoples internationally? Well, internationally something comes up and becomes an agenda because there is a problem. We realize there is a problem, that's why we talk about it. And uh, indigenous peoples are about 390 million in uh, some 90 countries around the world. Uh, they represent, out of the six to 7,000 oral languages in the world today, almost 5,000 are spoken by indigenous peoples. And we are told that about 95% of the languages will disappear before at the end of the century. So we understand the percentage of this means for indigenous and how threatened they are. Indigenous peoples uh, represent about 5% of the world's population, but 15% of the world's poor. This is world bad statistics uh, around the world. Even in developed countries, indigenous peoples have uh, go very much below the, the standard. For example, uh, um, they live uh, shorter lives, have poorer health care. A, na a native Aboriginal child in Australia today can expect to die almost 20 years earlier than his non-native compatriot. This is a statistic, a UN and actually Australian statistic. So indigenous peoples are displaced by war. The weapon of rape is also used uh, in, against indigenous women in order to intimidate the communities. Indigenous peoples are displaced. Uh, from their lands and deprived. Uh, in one recent um, uh, statistic, according to the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, of a study, a study on violence against women, more than one in three American Indian and Alaska Native women will be raped during their lifetime. A comparable figure for the U.S. as a whole is less than one in five. And one of the most serious shortcomings in human rights protection is the treatment of indigenous peoples in the justice system. So who are the indigenous peoples? We have no definition of indigenous peoples of the United Nations. This should not be a surprise because, for many reasons. But there are many other important terms that the UN does not define, like minority, even the word peoples, even the word, word family, even the word terrorist, not defined. And yet we do a lot of work on these topics based on, right? So, however, we have a practical understanding. We have not adopted uh, a definition, but we have a practical understanding based on a, mon a, a monumental study that the UN did uh, back in the 70s. So we understand as indigenous people the people who lived in a territory before colonization or conquest or invasion. And these people wish to continue existing as distinct peoples, preserving some parts of their culture, all their culture, their customs, religions, languages. And they also wish to pass this identity to future generations. This is a very important subjective criteria. In other words, indigenous peoples are those who wish to remain distinct. If they do not wish to remain distinct, we would not even know about this. Right? So wishing to remain distinct. Self-identification is a crucial part of this understanding of who are indigenous. In other words, somebody who comes from the outside, whether it's you know whoever that is, including the government, cannot say you are indigenous or you are not indigenous is by self-identification at, at an individual level and also acceptance by the group to which that person says he or she belongs. So this is uh, the rule of thumb. In other words, we accept the self-determination in terms of uh, identity. He or she who wishes 
to be considered as such. I would like to divide uh, these remarks and this story in two periods. One is from the Second World War, from 1945 to roughly 1993, it's the first period, and then 1991 to now, because these have different characteristics, so that we see the, the birth of the indigenous movement. So, how did the first indigenous issues come to the attention of the UN? You know how? Through labor, the issue of labor. Because the world realized, the UN realized that uh, there was slave-like labor, slave labor that indigenous peoples were suffering. So the International Labor Organization, ILO, did a study and found that out, and as a result, adopted in 1957 ILO Convention 107 on indigenous, on tribal populations, as they called it at that time. And uh, this, this uh, treaty was later uh, criticized as assimilationist and replaced. I will talk about that. But when we come to the United Nations proper, it is in the human rights system that the indigenous peoples found an opening, knocked at the door and it opened at the beginning of the 70s. That happened. In 1972, this is the first indication that we have, that the UN wakes up to this. Uh, because of uh, denunciations we were getting about what was happening in Latin America, especially Guatemala, many massacres and so on, the UN decided to do a study on the problem, as they call it, the problem of discrimination against indigenous populations. This was the title they gave to this study. So they mandated this study, and uh, at the same time as we mandated the study, what was happening? We saw that we have the civil rights movement in, North, in the US, North America, civil rights movement is because the ideas move in the world. It goes to South America and not to other parts of the world. So we see that the indigenous people start organizing themselves and they start articulating their visions for the future and their ambitions and how they see themselves in human rights terms. So uh, the first indigenous organizations start being created in the United States of America, Canada, South America, Northern Europe, the Sami people, yeah? Uh, and, in, and I know from my friends in the Philippines, in the Philippines you started having a movement. I don't know what was happening to the, in Nepal. I stopped myself to say here that you have to provide this history so that then when I give my next talk I can say when this was done. So this is part of, of people, you know, people who have been oppressed taking their history in their hands. This is what we call, you know, um, empowering. Uh, history writing. And in 1977, something amazing happened in Geneva. The indigenous globe, all the indigenous organizations that have been created, held their first meeting among themselves. 1977, this happened in Geneva. So you had all over the world the people coming there and meeting. I was a student then in Geneva and I saw all these indigenous in the cities. Who are these people? Where are they going? And I found out later when I was hired at the United Nations. Now, what happened with this study that's very important for us to understand how the UN was very responsive to what was happening. Normally, a study at the UN is something like intergovernmental comparative. You ask all the governments what laws do you have on this topic, you compare, and you draw a study. But my mentor, it, he was Mr. Augusto Williamson Diaz, who lives still, he's about 90 years old now, he was a political refugee from Guatemala at the time. He realized that unless we would have the voice of the indigenous peoples in the study, it would not have the legitimacy that we needed to have. So what he did, instead of the study taking on four or five years maximum, which is the normal, he delayed it, he delayed the study. And he said, I need to order 36 monographs, about 36 situations. So it got very protracted, you know. And he was able to gather voices and elements and information from the indigenous movement that was being born at that time. 
So this study became, de facto, the longest study in the UN, the most voluminous, and the one that took the longest to complete. At the end of the study, 1982, the UN establishes the first mechanism on indigenous rights. We were calling it then UN Working Group on Indigenous Populations. You know, we don't need to worry about this. If you need this outline, I'm going to send it to Sangini and we'll distribute it to everybody if you need it, to have this, you know, this story. So we come to this working group. This was very low in the hierarchy of the UN. You know, if I had a blackboard, I would show you. It was a very fragile mechanism. It was composed of five non-indigenous human rights experts. And there were some human rights organizations, about 15 organizations appearing in its first year, in 82. But what the, the amazing thing that this working group understood, again, is positive exceptionalism, I call it. They realized that they wouldn't have legitimacy unless the indigenous peoples who were in the corridors hovering, but not allowed in. If they were not allowed in, the working group understood it wouldn't have legitimacy. So it created an exceptionalism and said, OK, we are going to allow indigenous representatives to come to the meetings and speak. And starting in 83, we started having the indigenous voices. It could be like the community representative. It didn't have to be a non-governmental organization. That was an unknown concept to the community level. It was community level people. And so from having about 15 persons at the first session of the working group, later on and now at the permanent forum, which is the successor of the working group, we have 1,500 and more indigenous leaders who come to the permanent forum every year. So you understand the amazing uh, you know, reverberation of this decision, of the opening of that particular door, and this exceptionalism uh, of the United Nations. And then this working group had two jobs. It had first to hear developments about human rights affecting indigenous peoples. So it meant that indigenous peoples were coming and sharing stories about what was you know, what were their issues, their problems. And the governments were obliged in this public forum to show up and answer, you know, internationally. And sometimes, even if you didn't have, you know, dialogue among indigenous and governments at home, they would have this dialogue at the UN. The UN obliged the governments, you know, to show a good face, so they were obliged to show up and come there. And the second job of this working group was to develop new international human rights standards on indigenous people's rights. And therefore, slowly, slowly, from 84 to 93, the working group developed a draft declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples. That was the first draft that was made. And we reach now 93, and 93 was a very critical year because we had this very big and important uh, uh, UN conference, International Con World Conference of Human Rights, we call it, in Vienna. And indigenous peoples were there massively. And they were doing uh, many demonstrations. One of them consisted in them having a, a big sign with the word S, with the letter S. And they came into the room with the S. And there were many S's. Because they were saying, we are peoples. We are not populations or people. We are peoples, meaning with the right to self-determination. Because the right to self-determination in international law is recognized to peoples. So they were demonstrating. Unfortunately, in the World Conference, they did not put the word peace in the text that they adopted. Just people. They used people. It was not yet right, right? 93 World was also the international year of indigenous people. At that time, we called it people. And you saw in Roberta Menchu, an indigenous woman who became goodwill ambassador of the United Nations uh, on the international year. She was also Nobel laureate, uh, Roberta Menchu. And also, in 1993, uh, it was decided 
in the World Conference of Human Rights, that, number one, the declaration, the declaration, and secondly, that we should start having a decade of the world's indigenous community. And thirdly, that we should have a permanent forum on indigenous issues. So there were a lot of elements and political will that was put in that World Conference document of 1990. So, and then we start the next, uh, uh, the next period from 93 to today, which is really the flourishing of international institutions at the global level that have to do with indigenous uh, people. First of all, there is a monitoring mechanism, the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous People that was created. The job of this rapporteur, of this expert, of the Human Rights Council, is to receive complaints from indigenous peoples around the world and do country visits to the, actually right now he's visiting the United States of America on an official visit and to present a report to the Human Rights Council and to the General Assembly of the United Nations. So this is one mechanism that was established. The other mechanism was the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, which is the highest body, it's at a very high level. Again, if I could draw it, you would see that there is no comparison between the working group, which has now disappeared, and the Permanent Forum. It's a very high level body. And in, again, in an unprecedented way, positive exceptionalism, right? You have this amazing thing that indigenous experts, eight of them, this is 16 members, eight of them are government nominated, and eight of them are indigenous nominated. And they are sitting around the table at the level of parity, deciding together. This is amazing. It doesn't happen for any other UN body. Why do you think? Why? Sangini, you were in my class. <laughs> Why? Because, you know, states don't give, give power unless they feel a little afraid, unless they're a bit cornered. Huh? Now we have to talk politics and understand this. It's the strength of the movement that did this. It doesn't happen in any, any other field. So, this body deals uh, not just with human rights, because indigenous peoples and states did not want to stay only with human rights. That was the beginning. It was the opening of the door that we were created. But wanted to talk about development, environment, health, education, culture. So the whole specter of life uh, was, is part of the permanent forum's mandate. So, in this most recent period, the, the biggest, I would say, all these are such huge developments, is, of course, the adoption of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2007. This was the most amazing event, and I would like to talk about it later with time. Uh, but that, uh, that seemed an untouched dream early on became a reality in 2007. Uh, and uh, last but not least, in 2008, we have the creation of one more UN mechanism, which is called Indig uh, the Expert Mechanism on Indigenous Peoples' Rights, which is part of the Human Rights Council of the UN, and its job is to do human rights studies that have to do with indigenous peoples' rights and issue advice, policy advice based on the studies. So they have done the study on education and on participation until today. Now, um, let me come to the declaration. A little bit of a taste of this declaration. This was a huge negotiation. And then it, normally, when you have declarations or treaties negotiated at the UN, they are negotiated among governments. Right? This is intergovernmental. But in this case, it was a negotiation between indigenous peoples and states. The UN was just a broker going in between. Amazing, you know? And so you had this very powerful focus indigenous caucus, you know, adopting opinions, pushing them, and you had the states. 
And what you had two major difficulties in this declaration, two major topics of substance, the right to self-determination and the right to lands, territories, and resources. These were the two toughest <coughs> uh, topics. I would say the second more than the first. So when the working group finished the first draft in 93 and sent it up to the Commission on Human Rights, the Commission on Human Rights said, hmm, this looks too ambitious, you know. Let us set up an intergovernmental working group to deal with it. So in 96, the Commission on Human Rights established an intergovernmental working group. Again, the indigenous peoples fought and were represented in the same way that I explained before. And it took the Commission on Human Rights, which was renamed afterwards to Human Rights Council, 10 years. Some governments thought that it would never pass. They didn't want it to pass. Canada in particular was going to all its uh, you know, uh, friends in Africa, to whom they give a lot of assistance money, and they were telling them, don't support this declaration. Uh, they were also telling, uh, you know, whispering that, well, if after 10 years we cannot adopt it, it means we have to shelve it. It means we don't have enough consensus in the international community for such a thing. That's how sensitive things were. Fortunately, the last two years, you know, before 2007, from let's say 2005 to 7, a number of indigenous delegations and countries, friends, sat down and said, okay, what are some changes we have to make to the text so that it will pass? So, one of the major changes was an addition at the end, in the last uh, article 46, that says that nothing in this declaration will be interpreted as undermining the territorial integrity of the state. So that it would allay the fears, you know, of you know, the, the idea that uh, possibly that indigenous peoples would uh, cut, divide countries into many, many countries. That was not the case. That, that was not what indigenous peoples wanted, for that matter. So that's what made it pass. But uh, I'm still doing the overview in general, and I, I, and I will stop for a discussion, and then we go a little bit into the declaration. So, um, um, okay. Um, what I would like now to, to stop, I stop the declaration discussion, because I will come back to this later. And say, but in the middle of these difficulties that I'm explaining, these are some good things that we achieved, and a lot of institutional progress we achieved. Mm -hmm. But do we have, and, but we know that the realities on the ground were and still are very difficult for the indigenous groups of the world. So we like to ask ourselves are there good examples? Are there good examples around the world? that maybe have achieved something good at home. We know, for example, that a number of, in this country, a number of Native American tribes have achieved to get their, their land back, or a large part of their land back, based on their negotiations and also on court cases. That is one type of, of good um, news or good example that we have. We know that Canada established Nunavut, you know this, it is in the, in the Inuit part of Canada, in the Arctic part of Canada. Uh, it is a huge territory which uh, they have called now self-governing territory, Nunavut. The Maori in New Zealand today have managed to obtain control of 40% of fisheries, 40% of fisheries in New Zealand based on the Treaty of White Tiger of the 19th century. We have had a landmark case regarding Nicaragua at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, where when the government gave logging concessions thank you, to a Japanese um, company without the consultation of the indigenous peoples, 
you know, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights condemned Nicaragua, that this was not right, that people had to be consulted and therefore, you know, ordered compensation to the indigenous community there. <coughs> in Ecuador, some, uh, in 2007, in Ecuador, uh, Ecuador said that um, it will not allow the oil companies to extract oil in indigenous lands if the indigenous people don't agree. Of course, Ecuador in the meantime has changed its opinion. It doesn't matter. At that time, it said that. I mean, these are small victories that we mark, you know, based on the rights of indigenous peoples that have been uh, proclaimed. And we know that a number of courts have used the declaration to recognize uh, the land rights of indigenous people in national courts. Now, why this um, uh, human rights debate has been going on and it's a huge agenda of the indigenous peoples? The indigenous peoples wanted to also impact on the development debate. What is development? The indigenous peoples started critiquing what is development. They wanted their, to define themselves development and well-being. And a very big role there has been played uh, by Latin America and not only. You know, Latin American indigenous have also invented terms, living well. And in the permanent forum, we prefer to talk about living well than about development. Because development sometimes is seen, can be seen, you know, as this linear thing. As going, you know, from, let's say, being hunter-gatherer to having a you know, a TV in every room. Is that development? I don't know. <laughs> this kind of idea. So indigenous people started questioning what is development and that they wanted to give their own opinion about what development is. So when governments or in the governmental organizations uh, and bilateral donors throw money at them or do some development project, they wanted to say what they want to do with this development and they want self-determined development. And if they want partly to adapt to the mainstream economy, okay. Or fully adapt, okay. Or not adapt at all. They may want to stay in a subsistence economy. So this, was, this is another big part of the debate uh, at the United Nations internationally. The last thing I want to, uh, to mention is uh, that um, what has created, what has made the indigenous agenda into a, a very high, high level item internationally is the human rights agenda. Because you know, uh, the human rights agenda has a particular edge that other agendas don't have. For example, the social agenda doesn't have the same edge. Human rights agenda has an urgency. It, it's also very critical to government. It goes like to the heart of the government, you know, critiquing how they exercise power. So it matters to government. It bothers government. That's good because government notices. So indigenous peoples use human rights agenda also for real reasons because it was the only area of the UN that allowed human beings real people to come in instead of just government representatives. So it was, but at the same time, it had this other edge that I mentioned. So that's one remark I want to make. The other thing in order to understand, for us to understand, why would governments, states, allow this positive exceptionalism for indigenous people? Why would they allow these, you know, grassroots community leaders to come and speak their mind at these mechanisms? You know, we can ask ourselves, why make exceptions? They don't make this exception for anybody else, you know? Well, it was because in the 70s, this coincided with the anti-colonial agenda. Remember, this was the time that we had the decolonization uh, major era of decolonization, 60s, 70s, new countries created based on the decolonization agenda. And there was a lot of um, uh, bad conscience, maybe. And the indigenous groups rode on that, you know, on that decolonization agenda. It had a legitimacy, tremendous legitimacy. So 
States at that point thought that indigenous peoples are now at the brink of extinction. They are poor, very poor, you know, very marginalized. They are going to disappear. So it was a little humanitarianism and a little bit, you know, bad conscience that made them be permissive and to open the door. By the 1990s, this was no longer the case because the indigenous peoples had become much stronger with their movement because the UN gave a space for this movement to be created. And actually the movement, I open parenthesis to say the movement is truly global. One person, John, writes from the Arctic to Mary, who is in the Philippines and in Nepal, and somebody else answers from New Zealand and from Peru. And they're linked through the internet. And they talk to each other. It's a real family out there, the movement. It's a true movement that has, has been created. So by that time, by the 90s, it was no longer the case that indigenous peoples are these poor people that are disappearing and it's all humanitarian. Through the UN, they had strengthened themselves tremendously. And also in Latin America, and that we also have to say, because governments don't budge unless they are a little bit afraid, we had, don't forget, let's not forget, we had a number of violent movements of the, on the part of the indigenous peoples. You had also the Zapatistas in Mexico. Zapatistas in Mexico, you had Bolivia, where with some 80% of the population indigenous, it was a new apartheid situation. They had never reached any power. They were totally excluded in Bolivia. No political or economic power. So governments, because especially from Latin America, came the big, I think, breakthrough. Because they saw the indigenous peoples so empowered and articulating in strong ways their <coughs> ambitions, you know, to participate in power, that they then said, no, it's better to recognize their rights. Because when you recognize rights, it means you start dialoguing with people on the basis of human dignity. And that's how the, the climate changed very much. And states started seeing the indigenous peoples in a different light. Um, I would like to, to end here this part uh, by, again, a similar anecdote like the one that I started. In, uh, uh, in 2008, we devoted uh, the session again to indigenous women because uh, indigenous women is, a, uh, is a, a topic that comes periodically to the forum. The forum pays a lot of attention to this topic. And uh, um, we uh, uh, received as a secretariat of the forum uh, an email from a lady who said she was the great-granddaughter of this guy uh, who had gone to the League of Nations in 23. And she said, we are watching your work and we are so happy. And if my uh, grandfather would be so happy to know that this is happening at the UN now, that his voice has been heard, you know, in this very poetic way. So we invited uh, this lady and she came and she gave a beautifully symbolic speech, a young lady. And uh, actually, and four months ago, I met another great granddaughter of this guy, who is a lawyer, a Native American lawyer, uh, very active in the Indian Law Resource Center. So basically, what we see happening is that indigenous peoples uh, you know, are finding the thread in their histories, right? And finding ways to empower themselves and to continue the struggle now using the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So this is the first part I wanted to share, but I want to open it because I'm sure there are so many things that I have touched and uh, mm -hmm. You know, normally I use a whole semester to talk about these things in my class. Uh, but um, uh, before I go to some more details about the declaration, which is very real, uh, and it should be used by people, uh, 
I would like to open it to some comments and uh, questions, doubts. <laughs> And then other different organized and leaders, and director, and then other journalists, and also other public, and then providing this uh, place for this project, and then like Elsa's is kind of the.